Hey folks, it's even colder than it was yesterday. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, I, I'm I'm not in Ohio or, or somewhere like that where it's actually cold, but for California, this is damn cold. And I'm out here doing this for you folks. <laughs> so I thought I would do a little bit more about that idea of no mind since people seemed to be interested in it. There is a book that I have not read, and I'm not going to review it, called Thoughts Without a Thinker. Uh, and it's by a guy, I remember his name is Epstein, I believe his name is Epstein, and he's a psychiatrist, and the book is about how Buddhism is a primitive form of psychiatry. Well, I, I was just looking at reviews of the book, and that's what people seem to say, which is why I'm not that interested in the book, because I don't think Buddhism is a primitive form of psychiatry. Of course, I may be giving the book a you know, disservice by saying this, but the thing is, I like the title. Uh, I like the title uh, because I think it expresses something that's very important in the Buddhist tradition in that we imagine that thoughts have a thinker, but that might not be true. So we have our thoughts and we think that our thoughts are being done by someone called I uh, or, or by an entity called mind or by a physical object called the brain. and. You know, you can make a case for this, but for those of us who meditate a lot, who do zazen a lot, a specific form of meditation where you're just trying to let everything go and just let everything be exactly as it is, it's really difficult to find a thinker of your thoughts, of my thoughts. But conventional language forces us to say, say it this way, I said thinker of your thoughts, as if my thoughts belong to me. In the Zen tradition, there isn't a whole lot of talk of this sort of thing, except, you know, arguably among more contemporary teachers. You don't find it much in the tradition, but you do find a lot of this in the Advaita tra tradition, Advaita Vedanta tradition. And the common way it's often phrased is in terms of seeing rather than of thinking, but you can apply the same logic to thinking. So we, we imagine that there is a seer, seeing, and the thing seen. Where's Ziggy? Say hi to everybody, Ziggy. So there's Ziggy, and I am the seer of Ziggy. And Ziggy is the thing that's seen, and in between that is the act of seeing. And what they often point out in the Advaita tradition, which I can't argue with, is that the we normally think of a solid object as the seer and a solid object as the thing seen, and then sort of play off seeing as just, uh, it's just something that happens. Seeing is just something that happens. But what the Advaita tradition does is they take that and turn it on its head and say that seeing is the thing. Seeing is the real thing that we can say is actually occurring. That's the reality. The thing seen and the thing doing the seeing are questionable. Uh, we don't know if they really exist. Now, one place where we do get this in the Zen tradition a little bit is in a chapter by a Dogen called Seshin Sesho, Expounding the Mind and Expounding the Nature. And the introduction to this by Nishijima Roshi goes, Setsu, that's the first character, means teach, explain, or expound. Shin means mind, and Sho means the essence or the nature. So Seshin means expounding the mind, and Sesho means expounding the nature. Some Chinese Buddhist monks asserted that expounding the mind and expounding the nature belong within the sphere of intellectual effort, and so to make such effort to explain the mind and, and essence is not only unnecessary but also detrimental to the attainment of the Buddhist truth. They believed that the Buddhist truth could never embrace intellectual understanding. Master Dogen had a different opinion. He thought that the concepts Seshin and Sesho in Buddhist thought refer to something much more real. He understood Seshin Sesho as the manifestation of the mind and the manifestation of the nature in the real world. Master Dogen saw no reason to deny the concepts Seshin and Sesho. Instead, he used them to explain the fundamental theory of Buddhism. That's some difficult and heady stuff, but I'd just like to introduce you to a couple of lines from this chapter, which 
admittedly, I haven't read thoroughly for a long time, but it's uh, it's a nice chapter, and I should go more into it. And if it weren't so cold out, and if it were, they weren't expre uh, expecting rain later on, I might have been like really thorough in this before I did the video. So we'll see. Maybe tomorrow I'll do a thorough video after reading the whole chapter once again and really getting my head around it. So I'm just going to present you with a couple of a couple of sentences. Now. Uh, what he does in this paragraph is that first he gives a, a quote from a Chinese master uh, who he kind of is going to diss. So I'm going to forget about the quote and get into the diss because that's where he kind of talks about his idea of what mind and nature are. Uh, he says he because he understands that mind is only thinking, sensing, mindfulness, and realization, but does not understand that thinking, sensing, mindfulness, and realization are the mind, he speaks like this. So, it's, it's similar, I, I know the connections might be tenuous, uh, but I think it's similar to what the Advaita people say about seeing and seeing and seer. Uh, the, the thinking is the mind. So it's not that the mind does thinking. The thinking is the mind. That's what mind is. That's the expression of mind. That's the seshin, expression of mind. And he says another thing in here which I really like, and it's slightly tangential to the argument I'm trying to make, but I, I like it so much that I just want to give it to you because I think it's a really nice, hopeful sort of thing. From the time we establish the Bodhi mind, from, from the time we decide we want to study and understand the real nature of life, the universe, and everything, uh, and direct ourselves towards training in the way of Buddha, we sincerely practice difficult practices, and at the time, though we keep practicing in a hundred efforts, we never hit the target once. Nevertheless, sometimes following good counselors, which means listening to teachers, and sometimes following the sutras, which means reading stuff, we gradually become able to hit the target. One hit of the target now is by virtue of hundreds of misses in the past. It is one maturation of hundreds of misses. Listening to the teachings, training in the truth, and attaining the state of experience are all like this. Even though yesterday's attempts to expound the mind and expound the nature were a hundred misses, the hundred missed attempts to expound the mind and to expound the nature yesterday are suddenly a hit today. When we are beginners in practicing the Buddha way, even though, due to lack of training, we have not mastered the way, we can never attain the Buddha way by abandoning the Buddha way and pursuing other ways. It is hard for people who have not mastered the whole process of Buddhist training to clarify this situation as a fact. The Buddha way, at the time of the first establishment of the will, is the Buddha way. And at the time of realization of the right state of truth, it is the Buddha way. The beginning, the middle, and the end are each the Buddha way. It is like someone walking 1,000 miles. The first step is one in a thousand miles, and the thousandth step is one in a thousand miles. I just really like that because even for me, who's been doing this for 30 odd years, I sometimes feel like, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm still not getting it. I'm still working on it. I still can't quite say it the way I want to say it. And this video is probably a prime example of that because I feel like I'm just all over the place today. But though those misses are, are happening, the misses are part of hitting the target. So there you go, a little bit about expounding the mind and nature, a little bit about thinkers and thoughts, but a lot about, you know, encouragement to keep on practicing, keep on doing it, because even when you feel like you're completely missing it and completely not getting it, that is how you come to get it. That's really important stuff, and I, I think that's uh, really significant. So to sum up, just because you're thinking doesn't mean that you are thinking. Also another thing Dogen points out in this that I'll stick on here is thinking is fences, tiles, walls, and pebbles. I think that's how he says it. Something like that. He always points out this idea that the material world that we see in front of us and the experiencer of that world that we feel is inside of us are not two different things. They are the same thing 
projected outward and projected inward. And what he advises to do in order to understand this, this is to turn our attention inward and see what's going on. And we do that through the practice of zazen, through the practice of meditation, if you will. I'm just seeing, I don't know where Ziggy went. It's windy out. He doesn't like it windy. I don't like it windy. It's too cold to be out here. So I'm going to go inside, edit this thing, and put it up. Oh, there's Ziggy. And, uh, hello, Ziggy. Are you still there? Where are you? There you are. Hi, Ziggy. Hi, Ziggy. Hello. So, if you want to send me money to buy food and toys and things for Ziggy, send it right here to the address you're seeing below. Those donations are my only way of making a living and my only way of feeding Ziggy. So thank you very much for those donations. As always, if you're having financial difficulties or anything, don't donate to me. Donate zero to me. I don't, I don't need it that bad. But the fact that so many of you are donating little amounts here and there is why I don't need it so bad. So thank you very much for your kind donations and your continued donations. See you next time. Have a good time. Time all the time. Bye later. Bye. I'm going to go in and get out of the cold. Bye.